Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship here at MacArthur Salvos. To focus us as we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to read from Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Hallelujah. Today we do take a break from our Genesis series and we will be looking at Jesus bringing life where there is death. And to some extent, every Sunday, when we gather for worship, when we meet online, when Christians around the world have been doing this for thousands of years, we do so because we are commemorating and celebrating the resurrection of Christ. That's why we gather on a Sunday. It's like Resurrection Sunday is commemorated once a week. And so as we sing this first song, this opening song, we've chosen it because of the verse that says, Crown Him the Lord of life who triumphed over the grave. That is why we celebrate that we serve a risen Saviour who lives that death may die. It's worth celebrating. So let's crown Him this morning. Crown Him with many crowns. Let's sing.
name is powerful and wonderful and beautiful. And we say that and declare that today. And we claim it. We claim that Your Name has power over darkness. It's freedom for the captive. It is mercy, it is love and it is powerful. So for everybody who is seeing this today, for everybody who is once again coming into Your presence today, I I just pray that they would be able to feel the powerful nature of Your love and of Your presence to not discount that though they might be alone, though they might be in a different place right now to where they would usually be on a Sunday morning, that You are with them, that Your presence is with us wherever we go and it is powerful and it is wonderful and beautiful. So as we open Your Word today and as we hear what You have to say to us, I ask that You would speak uh, something fresh, something new into our hearts that You would breathe into us new life, that resurrects dry bones, that brings us out of darkness and death. Would You breathe new life into us today, Lord Jesus? Breathe new life. Amen. Hey kids, welcome again to Kids Time Online. I hope you're well. School holidays, kind of extended unless you're doing uh, your home learning and I hope that that's going to go well this week. Now I have brought with me this morning some unusual foods, foods that you may not see paired together when you're having dinner at your home. In my yellow bread basket, I've got garlic bread. I'm a big fan of garlic bread. Maybe you are too. A couple of apples. These particular ones are the pink lady variety, though it doesn't matter which type of apple you might eat at home. And this is an iceberg lettuce. Now you may not eat these together or you may not think that they go together, but I want to tell you something interesting. And you can try this, grown-ups, if you're listening. I want you to give this a whirl and tell me if it works for you. I have experimented and I've found it to be true. Garlic bread or any kind of dish that is strongly flavoured with garlic, what we will, and I won't eat this because then it's all going to get a bit messy, but what you'll find is after you've eaten a lot of garlic, your breath will start to smell and not very nice. Your breath will take on the odour, the aroma of the garlic and you might notice it for hours For some people, even a day or so, it can even last overnight after you've brushed your teeth, the garlic odour will remain. Now, I've done some research and scientists have found that following garlic, eating garlic, if you eat some fresh uh, vegetables, but particularly, or fruit, particularly an apple, raw apple, can't be cooked, raw apple or raw lettuce, lettuce leaves, It does something on the inside. It neutralises this odour, this aroma, so that our breath doesn't smell. Can you believe it? It's true. You might be thinking, what does this have to do with church or with faith? And this this is how I want to apply it to our lives. When we do the wrong thing in life, And I mean, it might be we say something that's unkind that we wish we hadn't said. Or it might be that we don't tell the truth about something. We might tell a lie. It might be that our teacher or a family member asks us to do something and we don't do it. We don't do what we're asked. Something like that where where we don't do what we should do or we make choices that, that are not very good choices. We call this, or there's a word that we can use for these things when we don't do the right thing, and it's called sin. And the Bible talks about it as well. And the thing about sin is that it can have a lasting impact, can make us feel a bit 
blah, a bit meh. It kind of has its own, almost like it has an aftertaste, an aroma. See where I'm going? The apples, the lettuce, the thing that neutralises that and gets rid of that feeling, that yuck, blah, meh kind of feeling. Only Jesus can do that for us. And so what I, want to, what I want to invite you or encourage you is that when you do the wrong thing, and we all do, we all make mistakes, even if I do the wrong thing, what I then do afterwards is I ask Jesus to forgive me. And I ask him to make those things right and to make me clean, to forgive me of my sin, to make me right again, to make me whole again. And you know what? He is able to do that. He's able to do his work from the inside out so that there is no lasting effect of sin, of that bad stuff in our lives. He is able to do that. So I hope that that gives us some food for thought this week. And you might want to give it a try next time you're having garlic. You might want to have some apples or some lettuce on hand to try that experiment yourself. Have a wonderful week. And now for some announcements for us today. Uh, just a few things. So first of all, you would already be aware that the lockdown restrictions in Sydney have been extended by a week. So uh, we're not quite sure again what that will mean for us next Sunday, but we will communicate as soon as we are able about what that will look like for us. But regardless, we are committed and so long as we are able, we will continue to offer this online, this digital format for worship so that we can continue with our Genesis series next week. We have modified our prayer meeting to be back online, completely online, and so we're trying out a new time slot, a Thursday night prayer meeting, Thursday nights at 7.30 on Zoom, and we've had some good attendance uh, both weeks, both times that we've done that to date. So if you're free on a Thursday night at 7.30 and if you know how to use Zoom or if you think you might be able to but you need some tech support, just reach out to us. We can help you get connected. We can provide you with the link or the Zoom information that you need to be able to join us for prayer this coming Thursday night at 7.30. And finally, uh, the division, as, they ha as DHQ has done in the last 12 months, there is another divisional worship service that has been streamed today. And so we're making that available on our social media channels this afternoon. So at four o'clock, uh, if you're joining us or linking up through our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, you'll be able to see that from four o'clock. Eyes high is uh, what the New South Wales and ACT Division have called these online divisional worship services and uh, that's available for you to watch this afternoon at four o'clock. And that's all from me. Today's uh, Bible passage is taken from the book of John, chapter 11. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 44, but to start just to verse 16. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. The Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. 
after he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him.
And now continuing John chapter 11 from verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called his sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she had got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. May the Lord bless this word to us. You might like to keep your Bibles open at John 11. This week, we diverge from our series in the book of Genesis to explore this passage from John 11. For the last few weeks, we've been hearing about the promises that God uh, had made to Abraham and Sarah. And we saw how sometimes God's timing doesn't line up with our own. The fulfillment of his promises, the enactment of his miracles doesn't always come when we want it. The story of Lazarus is no exception. Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, lived in Bethany, Judea, only some five kilometres away from Jerusalem. Jesus had visited there on multiple occasions. Jesus receives news from the sisters in Bethany that, that his dear friend Lazarus is unwell. We might be surprised when we read that when he finds this out, he delays his trip to Bethany by two days. We know that God has a plan, but he doesn't do anything without intent. Just as Jesus had said in response to hearing the news of his friend's illness, this illness does not end in death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
This sounds confusing to us and I'm sure also to the audience of his disciples. And it may leave us asking how God can possibly be glorified through the death of an already sick man. John 11 verses 1 to 16 is one of those passages of scripture where Jesus can be seen to speak quite cryptically. And the story is kind of a bit like one of those crime mystery novels that I really like. Um, And until we read the end of the reading, until we reach the time when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb, until he has already performed the miracle, until that final piece of the puzzle is fit in place, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Jesus only left for Bethany after Lazarus had died. And he says to his disciples again, quite confusingly, for your sake, I am glad I was not there so you may believe. So these events, Jesus delaying his trip to Bethany, he's saying that the illness would not end in death only days before Lazarus died, are confusing. Even Mary and Martha grieving the death of their dear brother were confused and I would probably suggest angry. Both of the sisters say to Jesus at separate points, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I think a lot of people in today's age might be able to resonate with that statement. A lot of people, believers and non-believers alike, and indeed myself, might say from a place of anger or desperation, God, if you had been here, this would not have happened. Or God, if you were really working in my life, I wouldn't be suffering. In the midst of grief and despair, we can't always account for what God might do next. In the midst of grief and despair, we can't always see that God is doing something. What we read next is one of those instances where we see Jesus as fully God and fully human in divine intersection. Mary came to Jesus and saw him when she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus is not unaffected by our pain. Jesus is troubled and moved by our grief, just as we are, by our pain and indeed by our sin. Despite his obedience to the divine will of the Father, Jesus is not unaffected by our pain. So that may leave us asking the question, if Jesus is so moved by our pain, if he's deeply saddened by it, why would he not leave for Bethany in time to heal Lazarus? Twice it was said to him, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. The sisters and the people had faith in Jesus' power to heal and restore to a point. But by now, so long after his death, the sisters felt that there was nothing left that Jesus could do. They had unknowingly placed limits on the extent of Jesus' power. So here comes another piece of the big puzzle which leads to the answer to why Jesus had delayed his trip to Bethany in the first place. Lazarus needed to have died For Jesus to show Mary, Martha and all of his disciples that he holds supreme power over death, hallelujah, with the ability to raise the dead to life. Lazarus may have been dead by the time that Jesus had made the journey anyway, but Jesus arrived four days after his illness had already progressed to death. But these four days are highly significant. And I'll tell you why. In first century Judaic law, it was taught that the spirit remained hovering over the body of the dead for three days after death. And in that time, the spirit remained with, uh, around the body seeking re-entry. There was some hope for res- a resurrection. But after three days, the spirit would leave and there was no longer any hope for resuscitation. 
the person was said to be irreversibly dead. This meant that if Jesus were to raise Lazarus on the fourth day when the spirit had already left, when he was permanently dead, both physically and under Judaic law, nobody could contest that it was really Jesus' miracle which had raised Lazarus from death, thus breaking, shattering the limits that Mary and Martha had placed already on Jesus' power. What felt like the end for them was only the beginning of Jesus' work. In Australia, even mild bushfires can be absolutely devastating. They can bring about some form of ending for so many people. However, many species of native Australian flora, seeds and plants require fire and its byproducts, its smoke, its ash, to be able to germinate and thrive. Something that feels so final and devastating is in fact the thing that also brings new life. Death felt so final and it feels so final. And they thought that Jesus, since he didn't come sooner, there was no longer any hope for healing. But their ending was only the beginning of Jesus' work. Sometimes it takes an ending to be able to see the extent of Jesus' resurrection power within us. In verse 15, he says, For your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. His timing was and still is intentional. What seems like the end for us is only the beginning of Jesus' work, friends. Upon arrival at the tomb, Jesus says to Martha, did I not tell you that if you had believed, you would see the glory of God? It's almost like a slap in the face, right? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Everything that Jesus had done was for the direct benefit of Mary, Martha and Lazarus and all who would witness his miracle. What seems like the end for us when we can't see why Jesus is delaying coming to our aid or moving in our lives or why he doesn't seem to be moving in our lives, what feels like the end for us is only the beginning of Jesus' work. Recently, probably a few months ago now, my dad started watching this show on Netflix called Formula One, Drive to Survive. It's quite dramatic, really. And when he started watching it, I didn't think much of it. My reaction was more like, wow, can't go fast. Great. (laughs) But once I had watched an episode or two, I started realising that there was so much more that happens behind the race that we don't always see. And I may have started watching it by myself as well. Uh, And I pay particular attention to the pit stops. Uh, I'm by no means an expert, so don't sue me if I get some facts wrong. Um, But every however many laps in the race, the driver needs to pull in for a pit stop. And that's between one and five times per race, as I've read. Uh, On a normal stop, the car gets four new wheels and a tank of fuel and sometimes some other repairs can also be completed. This can happen in less than two seconds. That's ridiculous. By the time they pull in, tyres are shredded and wheels may be buckled from collisions. If they kept driving for more laps, the driver would be headed towards disaster. Our lives can be much the same. If we are tracking on burnt out, shredded tyres, if something vital is broken, we are headed towards disaster. Jesus calls us out of death. And once we then come out of those dead places, those places holding us back from the full extent of God's glory, those barren and lifeless places, he calls us to take off the things that bind us to death. Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
Put on new wheels. Be filled again with fuel, with life. We cannot come out of a place of death and still be wrapped in it. How can we see God's glory and the fullness of life if we are covered in grave clothes? Once we come out of a place of death, we have to depart ourselves from the things binding ourselves to death. I should note that the Greek word used in both verses 33 and 38, where it says that Jesus was deeply moved, embramaomai, some commentators say is better translated to Jesus was outraged or Jesus was disturbed. His anger is being described here, right? He hates to see us in death, in sin, in dark places because of his love for us. We're not built to live in death. God's intention for creation was not for us to walk in darkness, but to live in the light, right? And the Bible says it over and over again. Ephesians 4, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And again in 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone and the new is here. And in Hebrews 12, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. If we leave on the things that are binding us to death, we set our trajectory straight to disaster. Out of his love for us, Jesus calls us out of death and then to take off the things that are binding us to death so that we can continue in his plan for us. I have a friend who is a police officer and as part of his unit, as part of his duties, he has to go to the scene of crimes. And if there's a deceased body, uh, so it goes, the old trick is to put Vicks Vapor Rub underneath your nose because death has a strong odour. And according to this friend, his uniform doesn't just come home to get washed like normal always. The fragrance of death is so strong, so potent, that the uniform that he's wearing goes to get destroyed. There is no washing out the smell of death. It's no wonder that there were such strict Judaic laws surrounding the clean or unclean nature of death. Even Martha, when instructed to roll away the stone, hesitates and says, but there'll be an odour. He's been dead for four days. Like it's obvious, right? There is no washing out the fragrance of death. But for us, there is good news. That when Jesus calls us out of death and to take off the things that are binding us to death, he has the power to leave no trace of it behind. Amen. The blood of Jesus, like nothing else, has the power not just to cover the fragrance of death like the spices that they used on Lazarus' body, not just to uh, cover it with some artificial scent, but to remove it completely. Only Jesus, only Jesus can lead us out of death leaving no trace of it behind. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can take the dead and give them new life. No trace of death being left behind. And just as the chorus goes, O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only Jesus, only God can lead us out of death, leaving no trace of it behind. If you only remember one thing from today, let it be that, that only Jesus, only our Lord who has resurrection power, has the power to bring us out of death, 
leaving no trace of it behind. We're going to sing that. them to be white as snow. 
nothing but your blood can resurrect us from a place of death and bring us into the fullness of life that we've found in you. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash our sins and our death from us, leaving no trace of it behind. We believe that and we ask you to work that way in our lives. We ask you that your blood would wash over us, that your anointing oil would fill every part of us, leaving us spotless, white as snow, Lord Jesus. We ask that the word that has been brought today would be impactful in our lives, that only you can bring us out of death, leaving no place, no trace of death behind. In your name, amen. So let's go forward into this week singing this song of salvation in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, fell through the pieces drought and storm. Romans chapter 6 verse 6 For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin amen because anyone who has died 
has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that now we also will live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He can not die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once and for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Amen. Have a great week and we'll see you next week.